Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on intelligence equals to sampling and filtering. So today is quite an interesting session because, you know, recent work has shown that like just on the ARC challenge, the abstraction and reasoning corpus challenge, just increasing the number of samples can actually get us to like close to state of the art, like 50% on the private test set, if that claim is correct. So it makes us wonder, or at least it makes me wonder, like how much of intelligence is actually just this repeated sampling. So if you have something that you can evaluate as a ground truth, like for ARC, you have the training set, you can see whether the program generated matches the input to the output. You know, if you have some kind of checks in that kind of environment that you are running, can we just use repeated sampling and then just evaluating it on that check? Okay, generate multiple possible programs and hopefully one works. So that's the premise of today's session. Just analyze how far we can push this idea and whether or not like intelligence, is it more than just sampling and filtering or it, could it be sampling and filtering? So I mean, if you want to know my take on it, I actually believe intelligence is highly this sampling and filtering. If you look at my roadmap to AI part three, it is all about multiple sampling and filtering at higher and higher levels. So let's start. So this is uh, something that I'd like to ask you. Like, have you ever experienced walking like very, very close to a high edge, like a cliff? And then how do you feel inside? Like, maybe you can give me some response. How, how would you feel when you go very near the edge of the cliff? Anyone? Mm, probably anxiety. Wouldn't want to fall, would I? Yeah, you feel excited, is it? Anxiety. Oh, anxiety. Yeah. Okay, so that's actually actually how I would feel. So like actually, even before I reach the edge of the cliff, just like a little closer would already make me have that feeling sometimes. Yeah, especially if it's a high place. So this kind of means that, you know, when you feel anxiety and you feel like um, scared or fearful, you know, it's your body telling you that, hey, maybe that's not such a great idea. So it's a good, it's a good sign because you know, we only have one life to live. If you try out all kinds of actions, like how a reinforcement learning agent would do, you will most likely end up like dying a lot of times in your life. Like, uh, let me tell you a, a funny story. Like some people have tried to use RL to do parking of a car. The car crashed like a million times, all right? So, so that's like how the kind of current mechanisms, like without any kind of feelings or fear, you know, it, they don't manage to, you know, preserve their life. Well enough. So that's not the topic for today. Today's topic is about like why do you think we will feel such nervousness or anxiety? And let me just digress a bit to mini columns of the brain. So this is a diagram from Numenta. So Numenta focuses a lot on this area of the brain called the neocortex. And the neocortex is basically this sheet that is wrapping over the, the brain. All right. And in, in this cortical sheet, there's a lot of these things called macro columns and in each macro column there's mini columns so this mini columns is like where the baseline processing gets done and i've actually done quite a lot of work trying to do like modeling of mini columns uh, not the neuroscientific modeling but like the ai kind of modeling and the kind of modeling is like you know given some kind of input all right can we do some form of processing in each column like parallel processing or parallel sampling in order to predict something so maybe what we are doing in our brains is like this kind of parallel prediction. Because you see, if you look at the previous diagram, there's like so many mini columns, like one mini column, uh, there's like 100 mini columns in one macro column and there's like 2 million macro columns. So there's like millions and billions of these mini columns. What if we are just doing prediction in each of them? And this prediction could be predicting the next action. Maybe some of them predict the next state. Okay, we, we are not too sure of that. So it could be that you're modeling different scenarios in your mind. And when you go closer and closer to the cliff, you actually, one of them may model you falling off the cliff. So, you know, I, I, I have kids and sometimes when I carry the, the baby and the baby like flips his neck backwards, I feel a sense of fear because in one of my scenarios, maybe the baby drops to the floor. So this, okay, this is my hypothesis. Fear circuits are triggered independent of the brain. So I, I believe there's a separate co mechanism from cognition that does with fear, that deals with fear. And this prevents us from doing actions that would potentially harm us. So this 
cliff falling is one of the situations that will actually destroy your life. So this will trigger the fear circuit. And I, I believe that whenever like one of these branches models the outcome of something bad, the fear circuit will be triggered and then you feel the sense of fear. Okay, this is my hypothesis. Of course, you know, in the earlier scenario of the cliff, you could feel fear just by association. Okay. But what I'm thinking is that maybe our brains does this kind of multiple prediction. And that's why we feel the fear. Okay, this is entirely my hypothesis. And one thing that a lot of people like to talk about in academia is like optimality. To make something optimal means you choose the best path when you navigate means you buy items that have the best trade-off in terms of value to yourself. And uh, optimality basically runs in many fields of, of, of our knowledge. And I would like to challenge that. I actually think humans are not optimal at all. I mean, <laughs> it's a very, very simple case in point. Like, do you walk the optimal route from, like, let's say, your room to the refrigerator? Okay, chances are is no. Right, we don't take all the way to the edge of the corner like F1 races. We, we don't do that. We just walk normally in the in the center of the path, maybe. Okay, so optimality is something that I don't think is inbuilt in humans. But we get quite close to optimal by repeated sampling. Okay, this is my uh, hypothesis again. So when you sample more and more, the chance of you sampling something that is quite good will be higher. Okay, take for example, Google search. You want to find something like, let's say you're flying a chocolate ice cream. You can search the prompt repeatedly, like chocolate ice cream, ice cream covered in chocolate, you know, um, brown ice cream that's that sweet. You know, you can you phrase the prompt in many different ways. There's a chance that one of them would actually get you what you want. And you, know, you can call that optimal, all right? So the hypothesis is that the more you sample, the, the, the increased chance that one of them will actually get you what you want or get you optimality. And seeking optimality itself is actually not the goal. The goal is just to search as many possible outcomes as possible, allowed by the compute of maybe your brain, and just pick the one that works best. Then how do we know what works best? You need some form of ground truth, some evaluator that can assess which one is good. So somewhere, there must be someone that says, hey, um, this path is better than the other path. So there, there must be some evaluator or some valid, validator. So this whole session is titled sampling and filtering. So you sample multiple times and you filter the branch that is likely the best based on some kind of metric. So what is the question to ponder here? The question to ponder is, can, this in, can just increasing this parallel searches already help with baseline intelligence. So just think about this as we go through the various papers. Uh, focus not too much on the math or their methodology, but more of like their broad idea. So before I move on to the different papers, can I just um, ask like anything you want to add or clarify here before we start? Okay, so I take it that all is good. So this is a graph that I've got from this paper toward the quantification of cognition. I thought it's quite a good graph. You can see from this graph that like the neocortex, which is just now um, whatever in the neo neocortex was in the mini columns um, image by Numenta, you can see that as we go from like mouse to humans, our neocortex increases exponentially. Okay, and the brain volume as well. So what does this tell us? Like a mice can do only so many things but humans can do so much more, maybe because of size or what. But one key factor is that the mini columns are replicated a lot more in humans compared to a mouse, and even compared to a chimpanzee as well. So could it be that just this replication of neocortex is enough for intelligence? Let's see. So the analogy I like to present is this part about aiming a ball. Okay. So, you know, with a small neocortex, maybe you can aim like five balls. Okay, so let me just write here. Uh, small neocortex, like uh, fewer mini columns. Aim fewer balls or throw fewer balls. And then if you have some like a larger neocortex, 
more mini columns. You can throw more balls. So I don't know if you have played this carnival game where you need to aim for the bullseye, like either using an arrow or a ball, you need to aim straight to the target here. Okay. How many of you think that you can hit the target in one try? Raise your hand or like, let's press one. Like if, if I were to, okay, maybe something more practical like um, that bot. Okay, how, how many tries do you think it would take you to hit the bullseye on a dart board? Anyone? Just, just give any response. Mm, wouldn't be first try. Oh, you probably. can get it, right? No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, my, my own, I think my old man could because he plays a lot of darts, but that's that's another conversation for memory. Uh, but if it's a first time for any agent, Probably 10, 20. It's almost at 50. Oh my. Yeah. I hope it's not 50. That's that's a bit high. <laughs> Vice says 20. Ray says 50. Personally, I think I will take about 30. Yeah, I'm <laughs> not very good with that. So yeah, thanks for replying. So you see, just even knowing your goal, like if you already know this target here, calibrating that ball to hit that target takes a while like you need to factor in the environment you need to factor in uh, different factors like professionals can probably hit it at one go but their environment is always the same okay so okay maybe not the same but they have they have learned how to factor in for the environment like you know golf you can do hole in one and you factor in for the win and so on same thing for aiming a ball uh, you but all this comes with lots of practice and yeah that's one thing if your neural network is more catered towards throwing the ball or throwing a dart you will hit the target most of the time even more than an amateur. Okay, but can an amateur do as well as the pro? Okay, take for example, let's talk about the best golf player in the world. Okay, I mean, last time it used to be Tiger Woods. I don't know who is it now, but let's, for, let's say, for instance, Tiger Woods. Let's say he can score a hole in one, in one shot for, for this particular course. Then take for example, me, someone who doesn't play golf much. I'm sure if you give me a million shots, Maybe one of them might reach the whole one. So, so it's, a, it's, it's also about skill and also it's about repeated attempts. So even an amateur might be able to get the, the optimal solution if, it's, if he tries enough times, all right? But the more complex the environment, the, the, the more tries it will take. Like for example, um, if let's say the, the golf course is, or if let's say the target is really far away and you need so much precision to go and hit the target, you will take a lot of tries and even so you may not hit the target. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that repeated sampling is like throwing this ball, okay? And how well this ball hits the target depends a lot on how well tuned your network is, your neural network is to, to hit those targets, to seek the, the targets out. The more you train in this task, the better your neural network at that task. Okay? But if your neural network is not trained at that task at all, Maybe you can repeat your, your sampling a lot of times and maybe one of them will hit the task. Okay, there's also another factor, you know, like, do you realize that when you throw the ball or like when you play golf, you can vary the strength, you can vary your angle, uh, you can vary maybe the posture that you're throwing it. All this might make a difference in how you throw the ball. Okay, that's another um, interactive question. How many of you here think that you should always use the same pose, you know, when throwing a ball, throwing a dart, or playing golf? Like, if you want to hit the target, do you always maintain the same pose all the time? Yes, uh, or at least use the same force, same strength, and fire, and hope that it works. Uh, how many of you here think that you will use the same, exact same kind of initial conditions? Okay, Ray says keep adjusting. All right, so the answer here is actually it depends. So if let's say your first shot is very near the target, maybe you just want to continue there and, and, and hope for the best. But in most cases, when you know you are just fine firing stuff out and you don't know for sure where is the target, okay, now we know the target for sure is here. Let's say we don't know the target can be here, the target can be here, and so on. Like you might want to spread your eggs out in multiple baskets and just throw at different angles, you know. I mean, there may be different ways to hit the target. And, you know, you might want to spread out your, your shots so that it covers a broader spectrum, all right? So repeated sampling is great, but if you have repeated sampling with various initial conditions, it might actually help you 
if your task is a bit more varied and might appear at different areas, okay, not just at the center. So imagine if you play darts and you have a moving dart board, you know, you, there's a chance that you might want to vary your, your starting angle a bit so that you have a chance to hit the bots at different position. Okay, then the last question is, if you're aiming straight, can you hit the bot that is behind you? Okay, this one, I, I take it as says no, unless you do a rebounds. So there's one problem with repeated sampling, and that is if you have no way to hit the target with the current trajectory you are taking, you will never solve the problem. Okay, uh, let me give you some examples of this. The example of this is that like, if you're trying to solve a math problem, but you don't know the, the theorem used, okay? Maybe you haven't learned like Pythagoras theorem. So no matter how you try to solve it with addition, subtraction, you know, you can't solve it because you just don't have the tools needed to solve the problem. Like if you have, if you do not have the skills or tools to solve the problem, you never will, okay? So this is something that is quite critical because contrary to like saying that, hey, uh, I can just sample more times and I can solve the problem. Okay, the answer is it depends. It depends on whether or not the sampling is in the right direction. If you are always trying to aim forward but your target is behind you, unless there's a miracle that the ball rebounces or something, there's no way you will hit the target behind you. Do you, 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 you all agree with that? Okay, so this basically summarizes what I have to say for today in this diagram of a ball. All right, so now let's dive in to the papers that actually talk about all this. And I hope you just keep this analogy of balls or darts or golf, you know, whatever works for you. Keep this analogy at the back of your head while we are looking through those papers because this will give us the background to understand how these papers work. If you look at my other sessions, I also like to use this kind of analogy because I think our brains think better in this kind of pictures rather than math, right? So let's start with the first paper, Alpha Code. I was very impressed with this paper when it first came out because I myself am, am a competitive programmer. So competitive programming is like you have a question that is posed to you and you need to create a program to solve it, a computer program to solve it. So Alpha Code supposedly could work as well as maybe the top 20%, I can't remember the, the exact statistics, but it's, it's really quite good. It's better than an average programmer. It can solve competitive programming questions just from the question itself. So when it first came out, I was quite impressed because it meant that, you know, large language models or transformers are getting somewhere. And I was very eager to get my hands on alpha code. Unfortunately, it's not open source, it's by DeepMind. Uh, but when ChatGPT came out, oh, I did exactly what they did in the alpha code paper on ChatGPT, and I got similar results. I, I use it to solve this um this this website called Coding Game, and yeah, it solved like about half the easy problems there. And I was quite impressed with the way LMs could solve programming questions. So how did alpha code work? Let's take a look. So alpha code basically this is the idea of you know train a lot. So their pre-training data they train on the entire GitHub. Okay. So like mainly is code, but code or not code, it doesn't matter because the pre-training, you can just expand out the, as long as it's, they realize that as long as it's code, even if it's not competitive programming code, it still help the model learn the syntax and so on. So this is mirrors a lot of the current pre-training era of large language models. You train on the entire web's worth of data. Relevant to your task at hand or not, doesn't matter. You will learn different kinds of understanding of the world based on the different kinds of data. Um, but one very important thing, the data should be something of good quality, all right? You don't train it on wrong code, you know, in, in the web data, you, you don't want to train on, let's say if you don't want to output like stuff that is a bit vulgar, you don't train on those websites that, you know, use all those language, okay? So this is the kind of stuff that matters a lot for a large language model or a data-driven model. You, you, you kind of need data. Data should be of good. All right, so you train on the data that is of good quality, but it can be quite varied. And then you fine tune on the data that actually is relevant for your use case. So this is the alpha code methodolog methodology. They fine tune on this website called Code Contest, which are competitive programming problems and solutions. They give the problems and solutions. 
And then what they did was they evaluated it on something different, another competitive programming website called Code Forces. And what they did was they in in the in the fine tuning process, this is the input. The input will be the problem. The output will be the solution. So for Code Forces, the input will be the the problem, and then the output will be the solution as well. But we are not too sure, okay, which solution is correct because you know, LMs they can generate a lot of things, but not all of them are correct. <laughs> If you have played around with it, you know, um, ensuring that it's valid is a is a tough problem. Oh, but luckily for us here in Alpha Code, we do have a ground truth. Okay, right? we do have ground truth because in the problem itself, usually the problem will come with example cases for input and output. So we can actually use these example cases to do some form of filtering. Okay. And then this will narrow down the large set of problems, a large set of solutions that we have found into a smaller set of solutions. And then we can send this to do the execution. So the key thing about alpha code is not so much the large language model portion because people have done that before. The key thing that they have introduced here is the idea of multiple sampling, giving a large set of possible solutions uh, so just to give you an idea of how large this is, it's about 1 million plus solutions. or in, 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 It's in the millions. And from there, you curate it to something a bit smaller. And then you can use this to run. Right? This multiple sampling and filtering increase the performance a lot. Okay, later, there'll be a diagram to show this. And I think the key takeaway here is that, you know, maybe for difficult problems, just sampling it once. It's not enough. Maybe you need to increase the amount of times you sample. Okay, so Ray asks, what do you mean by multiple sampling? Uh, you know, LMs, they actually generate things in a in a in, uh, probability for the next tokens. So, you know, if you don't use the highest probability token output, okay, let's say, for example, I am a student. So let's say the student is like 40% probability. Oops. And then you can also sample, I am a, I am a teacher. That's maybe 20% probability. And I am a coder, maybe a 40% probability. So, you know, based on the, the token that you sample, here I'm assuming that the token is this whole word. Um, but if you know about tokens, actually it's subwords. Okay, but I'm not going into the technicalities here. Assuming that we transcribe the next token and we get like 40%, 20%, 40%, the output for each of them later on would be different already just by taking the tokens um, generated at their probabilities that are generated. So, you know, instead of taking maximum likelihood decoding of the token probability probabilities, we can, we can like, you know, vary the tokens generated by some temperature. And based on that, you can get different outputs already just from the same prompt. So basically, um, you can just try it out on the ChatGPT web interface. You type in the same prompt, and then you refresh the chat interface, you type in again, you know, you might get different outputs each time. So um, yeah, that, does that answer the question of like, what is the multiple sampling here in, in a large language model? Okay, yeah, that answer. All right, so there's one more thing that AlphaCode did here that I liked a lot. Instead of just using the same prompt all the time, you know, like the same problem prompt, AlphaCode also does something called conditioning on metadata. So what are the metadata they condition on? So they condition on stuff like language. Do they use C programming? Do they use Python programming? Problem difficulty. So problem difficulty is there's a difficulty rating. Maybe you can have a difficulty rating of 800 to about 3500. The specifics I can't remember already, but the difficulty rating could be varied. Okay. And all this metadata could influence the kind of solution that you generate. There's also problem type. So like problem fact, is it a math problem? Is it a graph problem and so on? So this is like telling you some hints of the problem uh, of the program that you need to create. Like if I tell you that this is a graph problem, then maybe you'll think of graph algorithms like graph first search, graph first search, Dijkstra, Floyd Washell, those, those are the graph algorithms. You might think of this a bit more if I tell you the answer is graph, right? So we can condition the program on such things. Now is the time to show you the example. So this is an example code that was trained. So in the pre-training data, they also did something like that. At the start of the program, 
Okay, they put the rating, text, language, and whether or not the solution is correct or not. So I, I like this a lot because you, you can also put incorrect solution and you can learn why it failed. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of the data in um, this code process, like they may not be correct answers because like, honestly, the number of people who solve the problems are quite low, <laughs> All right, quite, quite few. So if you can say that in your, in your training data, hey, this is wrong data, but you know, maybe you can understand why it's wrong, okay? So this is something like decision transformers. You know, you, you, you can learn from the good and the bad by just saying that, hey, my reward is lower. So by just conditioning on correct and incorrect, you increase the number of training samples that you have. So I, I, I like this a lot. And a very interesting thing of alpha code is that everything is done using text. I mean, you, you could also, you know, put in the metadata as separate inputs to um, the pipeline of the transformer, but you know, just putting them as tokens at the start is, is the simplest way and it, it was sufficient already. So this is quite cool because just by varying this metadata at runtime, I change my rating, I can get shorter programs if the rating is smaller, I can get longer programs if the rating is higher. Changing my text, I can condition the output of my program to, to fit those texts. So they use about 50 metadata texts that are most commonly used and they just uniform sample over it. Language, you can use C program or Python. Uh, C is good for smaller, uh, I mean, for, for programs that need faster runtime. Okay, because C is more efficient than Python. I mean, recently, Andre Kapati also did lm.c, right? So um, it, it runs faster than Python because Python is an interpreted language. At runtime, it needs to call a lot of things and it takes up a lot of uh, latency. So C is a bit more efficient. It's closer to machine language, like assembly. So uh, last time I used to do in C. <laughs> yeah, I translated to Python after a while. Uh, Python is far easier to code. So um, the, the idea is, you know, you don't have to constrain it to only like one kind of language. You can use different kinds of language. So this is something like, you know, multiple abstraction spaces. You can use different abstraction spaces to solve the problem. Some problems might be better solved in C. Some problems better solved in Python. But you don't just fix it. You just let the program um, generate. Okay, I mean, over here, we fix it. But I'm saying that once we sample, we don't exactly sample from just one C program. We also can sample from Python programs. Yeah, and of course, when we want to sample the um, output for the solution, we always sample correct solution. We, we don't sample incorrect. But you know, from on training, we can also put incorrect. So this is an example of how the inputs for alpha code was trained, and the output is the code itself. Any questions for this? Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Let's see. Vaish asks, will the model eventually learn the route to the right program? Rather, can we train it? Okay, you mean whether or not for any arbitrary problem, whether the model can learn the right solution, right? Um, the answer is no. Okay, it depends on whether or not in the pre-training data, there's something relevant to it. Uh, so, you know, in the um, analysis for alpha code, um, they realized that actually graph problems are solved like quite, quite likely, quite high. Uh, in some work by Peter Velikovic on graph neural networks to solve like problems like this or so, like graph problems, he also realized that uh, GNN solve graph problems quite well. I mean, that's because GNNs are a graph. Okay, so um, the, the, the thing is, we only learn stuff that are similar to what has been trained before, like or at least a mix and match. Okay, that's why I said about the golf or the darts or the ball analogy earlier. If you don't have the skill sets required to solve that problem, uh, no matter how you sample, you will probably not solve it. All right. So if I never tell you about deficit search or breadth search in the training programs, and I test you on it, I, I don't think you're going to solve it. Right. <laughs> so so that's the answer I have. You need to have a wide range of pre-training data or at least fine-tuning data to cover the almost the entire range of problems that you might encounter in your tests in order to solve it. Yeah, uh, need, take note, it need not be an exact replica, just similar problems would be enough. Because as long as you can mix and match to those that you have already been trained on, you should be able to solve it. Yeah, okay, looks like you, you agreed. So um, this is also um, my issue with the up challenge. Uh, later, I'll talk a little bit on it. 
uh, the app challenge doesn't tell you what it's going to be tested on. It, it, it tells you generic stuff like, oh, it's testing on agentness. But you know, there's a million things that an agent could do. So th that's not a very good gauge of like how to constrain your, your testing to be similar to your training set. And there's a big difficulty increase in the training set to the test set. So um, that's not good cases to test generalization. So if you look over here, this is really the key idea that we need to see because this mimics the mini columns in the brain really closely. Different mini columns might have different biases and maybe one bias is like, you know, in this case, generate Python programs. One bias is generate C programs. And because of this bias, we get different samples. And these samples, we can then select the thing that works. And this is the winning graph, okay? So never before have you seen AI so aligned. Later in the papers that I show you, everyone draws this graph, okay? So if you want to publish a paper, just make sure you draw a line like that, all right? So <laughs> this basically says, all right, that the more samples you draw, the better your performance. That's all. Okay, I have just summarized this whole graph. All right, uh, conditioning on what, you know, um, correct tag, incorrect tag, all this, you know, um, those are just extra details. But yeah, it's also interesting to note that if you condition on incorrect tag, you can also increase the soft rate. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, that means although you sample it to generate incorrect solutions, sometimes, oops, I got the right solution. All right. <laughs> so yeah, if you have no tech at all, you know, it also follows around the same trends. So the main thing is not really the text here. The main thing is if you increase the amount of sampling, you can already increase the soft rate. And I, I'm not sure whether they have conducted experiments on this, but you know, if your text matches the solution you need, you should get higher soft rate. So it's like telling you, um, if the, again, in the ball example or the dart example, it already tell you where the position of the dart box should be. You don't have to guess or where the position of the, the bull's eye should be. You can literally aim your shots towards that direction. You keep throwing and throwing and you should get a higher soft rate than you just, if I just tell you, hey, the solution is somewhere in front of you, but you don't know where. Okay, that, that is that's worse. Okay, then you have to, you have to just shoot around randomly. All right. And this means that if you have a bit more targeted information or a bit more hints about where the solution should be, sampling there and focusing your efforts there would be a good bet. All right. This is uh, exactly the case when you have the dartboard in front of you. You just keep focusing on the dartboard. All right. And this idea of conditioning on the right metadata, very important. Okay. Keep that in mind. All right. Conditioning on the right metadata and increasing the sampling. These are very, very key ideas about how we can increase the efficiency of what we have generated. Uh, before I move on, any questions on alpha code? Because this is quite important. This is a very important paper. Can I ask you one more question? Um, sorry, I'm outside, so I've been typing. But uh, I might have missed this. How is metadata relevant here? Like, is it used to, like, find the short, uh, find the optimal, like, tool or the program to use? Like, that's probably what I was trying to go try, uh, trying to ask for the previous question as well. What's the relevance of uh, metadata here? Okay. So in this case, the metadata is nothing more than the text text over here. And by including this metadata, what happens is that the program is able to use this information to come up with the different flavors of programs down here. So uh, the metadata directly affects the output distribution. So if you put like a higher rating, the program would be longer in general. You put different text, the solution they use would be different also. So, uh, this Got is it. Like... Uh, so is it possible that if there's a similar problem that is encountered by the uh, by the model, it will be able to classify it because of metadata, or is it just because it will change the so the solution set that it uses? Uh, so this metadata should be the same format as how you pre how you fine tune it. So if your fine tuning set doesn't have this metadata, then this is kind of useless. So this metadata actually matches how the fine tuning set is so it's sort of like you can tell the model hey i want to get data of like the text that are math then maybe it's better able to retrieve those stuff out from the neuron weights okay so right now this is done using all um new neuron weights so memory is in neuron weights 
this is not the most uh, optimal. Now, you know, there's a lot more methods that could do other things, like we could use rec over text, um, like that is not in the weights. And also now um, the metadata over here is, the metadata is just text. You know, what if we can use the metadata to give different actions to the agent or give different input views. Like right now in alpha code, they only did metadata as text, but it would be better if I could just give different actions to the agent, right? If math agent, I can, I can tell you, use all these math equations. Graph agent, I can tell you, oh, use deficit, graph search. You know, if I can constrain your actions even more, the chance of you throwing the ball and hitting the target will be higher than if I tell you, hey, uh, math agent, use everything that everyone else knows. You know, it's like, um, how do I put it? If you are doing a job that is about putting balls into cups, all right? And I give you skill sets of grasping the ball and grasping the cup and, and moving your hand, maybe that's enough to do your job. But now I tell you, okay, go and learn Python programming, go and learn C programming, go learn how to draw, go and learn how to do this. If I ask you to learn like a million skills and I ask you to do that task again, the chance of you using the right skills to do that task will be reduced because there's so many other things that you can do. So um, this is the, the thing that I've learned also when I did the app challenge. Uh, later, you can see the paper I, I did. Like if we have too many actions given to the agent, okay, the chance of the agent following the right actions is actually lowered. So the solution to actually getting more reliable uh, sampling is to have agents that are more limited in their scope, but you sample multiple agents that have different action spaces. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, I see. So is that is that basically what you're trying to say with like uh, biasing and sample biasing? It's like basically constraining each one of these like columns could be agents in their own right, and they're each constrained to a certain bias, and they focus on that form of sampling, and it reduces the amount of sample you need, but also gets you higher quality samples to filter through. I think is what you're trying to say, right? In this idea, or am I off? Yes, correct. Okay. So, so I think this is quite an important idea because like these are the rudimentary methods that is done two years ago um, when people just use the metadata and use the same process to go through and generate the solutions. This is um, the fundamental idea, but this is not enough. This, I don't think this will get us anywhere close to general problem solving because the amount of action space is still too large. Okay. So I kind of spilled a bit of the secret sauce right at the start. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay, Let, let's continue to, to go on. So learning fast and slow is the next paper I'm going to talk about. Uh, this paper was the best paper finalist last year at uh, IEEE ICDL um, 2023. Uh, this is my paper, by the way. It's about how to do mountain sampling and filtering to solve a dynamically changing maze. All right. So this, basically what it does is, this is my landmark idea, fast and slow, uh, which I'm currently implementing in task gen to do arbitrary problems. So it's, it's similar in task gen as well. So what you do, okay, previously, the, um, like when you throw a ball, you know, you, 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 you don't have information of like maybe where your goal is, right? So like the competitive programming problems, we can give an idea of what the goal is by saying that, hey, you need to solve this, um, this question. And maybe you can give some hints about like, so in alpha code, this will be like, this will be like the what program needs to do, some hints about what program type it is. Yeah. So, so you could have some stuff like goal, and you can have your current state, which is like um what the current program is. So uh, one thing that is missing in alpha code is iteration. Like after they generate the program, okay, you could actually fine-tune the program based on not fine-tune, refine the program based on the output of that program, and then you can tell the model, hey, you did something wrongly. So if you use something like this, where you have your current state and your goal, you can do the refinement step and perhaps solve the problem better, right? So, so in, in some analogies like this, um, you throw a ball and then like, after you throw, I tell you, hey, uh, your ball was one CM lower than the target. So you can refine your throw angle. It's like, okay, I need to throw a little higher now. Okay, this is much better. This refinement step is much better than saying that, hey, I just asked you to randomly throw the ball without telling you the output. And then when you hit the target, I'll tell you, congratulations, you won. You know, that, that's not very informative. But if I tell you, hey, a ball is 5 cm left, ball 5 cm right, 
then you can adjust accordingly with this refinement step. So having the current state here with the goal acts as a kind of refinement step because you can do um, iterated steps towards the goal, All right? And then what uh, like this Python network is doing is actually just predicting an action to do, like maybe in the ball throwing case, it's the angle of the ball and the strength of the ball. In the alpha code case, this action could be generating the code, all right? As easy as that. This LM, this neural network could be an LM now, all right? Back then I used neural networks because it's faster, <laughs> all right? So um, there's this other part here, which is actually my main emphasis for today. So so this this thing here, okay, this is what is done in alpha code. Basically, it's the using the neural network to you know get the action out. Uh, but they don't have the intermediate iterations and so on. Okay, so the other side here is what I'm putting my bet on. Okay, this is memory, and in particular, I would like to say that just repeated sampling and filtering here is good enough for like intelligence like if you could sample and um, filter based on what you have encountered before in your memory okay maybe that would be enough to to get the um, like right answer already uh, of course if, in lms you can also multiple sample and filter here okay but back then in my work when i did neural networks there's no like stochasticity in the nm is it neural network um, it's normally just uh, a value out here. But if you are using large language models to do this, you can also filter on the left side as well. So this is neural network kind of memory. This right side is more explicit memory. And the key idea uh, behind this is that you have a goal. You are headed towards the goal. So you already know your target. And then you just try to, from the start state that you are at, try to go towards the goal. Okay, And you can either use whatever existing knowledge you have in your language model, or neural network, or you can use the knowledge in your external memory. So I'm just rephrasing this uh, work in modern lens. Okay, but the idea is that there's two networks. One is a neural network, one is a memory network. And I use it to solve like a dynamic environment where you start at anywhere and you end at anywhere. And there's an obstacle that will change after 50 episodes. Like initially it's like that with one small gap. And then after that, it changed to here. So you need to learn fast, okay, because the, when the environment changes, I don't want the agent to take a million episodes to learn again, like what um, Alpha Zero and Alpha Zero would take. I want it to learn fast. So the key to learning fast, I realize, is to encode some form of knowledge in the external memory. Like in, the, in, in this work, I encode the transitions, I encode the state, action, next state transition. Basically, like if you are an agent here, this is your starting state. And then if you take an action, which is like maybe you go to the right, you get your end state here. So I store this in memory. So this learning fast and slow, the left side, the left side is actually a crude approximation of where you should go based on your past knowledge in the neural network. The right side here is actually doing some form of graph search, okay, to find out where you should do, uh, where should you go next based on a path travers a path traversal in in your in your past state transitions okay so you can see like the left side is a bit more system one in daniel kahneman's term the right side is a bit more system two a, a little bit more planning a little bit more searching so the key thing i want to highlight in this work is actually more of this like um system two part the the searching part and i found that increasing the depth of sampling like how how many states you think ahead and also like increasing the number of parallel branches here Okay, all of them help to increase the, uh, firstly, we find the correct solution most of the time. And secondly, I have to emphasize it, find shortest path. So like steps above minimum is like using some form of breakfast search to give you the minimum path from the, the start state to the goal state. I, I then basically um, either sample in depth or sample in breath. Okay, so this is sample in depth and the optimized sample in breath. And you realize that as we increase the sampling, you will actually decrease the amount of steps you take to reach the angle. Okay, this means that actually having this planner module is very important because without the planner, if you can take a look without the planner, no slow, right? It takes like forever to reach the goal. But with the planner, well, the number of steps drop significantly. And with increased par uh, parallel threads, okay, the, the amount that it drops is also is actually quite significant. If you increase this to 200 or 1,000, 
increasing the breadth of search is actually like almost as good or even better as increasing the depth. And this means that maybe in the brain, you know, you increase the number of many columns already, it could jolly well lead you to find the optimal solution. Like you may not get the optimal solution, but there's a chance you will get it with increased searching. Right? Just like you have a target in front of you, I give you 100 trolls versus 1 million trolls. The chance of you hitting the bullseye is higher if you have 1 million trolls. So similar uh, analogy here. And you know, this, this all tells me that, you know, maybe the secret of uh, intelligence is not to use math equations to find optimality, but to just give you the right skill sets and biases. Like over here, the skill set is the transition. Um, state action state prime, uh, the, the future state. Like if, if I were to give you the right skill sets and I were to give you the right kind of biases and the prompting to reach the goal, I ask you to keep trying your best to reach the goal. Maybe that's enough already. Like, so this is in terms of the, the memory uh, part that you can increase sampling. You can also increase sampling here. That's why I said you can also sample this part many times if this is an LM. So this is the difference between like internal memory to the language model and the external memory. I think you can do both. Yeah. So this basically does, I just want to highlight that the main thing is sampling helps. <laughs> All right. This is the main takeaway. Uh, any questions for this? Okay. Uh, no questions. I'll move on. So now I will go to talk about the ARC challenge. Okay. Because ARC challenge is uh, recently quite important because of a $1 million price. And ARC challenge basically is a test to test on generalizability of an agent. And let me show you an example of an ARC challenge. So the example is like this. You are given the three things on the left. Okay, the bots are from one by one to 30 by 30 with a total of up to 10 colors of this. And then I want you to figure out exactly square for square, what this output example should be. If you get one square wrong, the problem is wrong, right? The solution is wrong. You must get all squares correct with the correct colors, correct position, and correct bot size. I won't even tell you the size of the bot, all right? So these bots are of different sizes, but the concept is the same. Anyone can tell me, I mean, if you all have been through my earlier sessions, you already know, but anyone can tell me what the relation between the input and output is for this case. Oh, uh, yeah, anyone? Yeah, just want to see whether. So, like, what do you think is, has changed between the input grid and the output grid? Well, I'm not the smartest guy, but it looks like it's just filling in the inner part of the shapes being formed. Yeah. Yeah, of the enclosed areas. Okay. So, this is the concept. All right. It's supposed to be easy for humans to understand. Actually, this is very hard for program because first you need to find out what's enclosed. You need to do some form of a, a flat view algorithm. Uh, sorry, not flat view. You need to do some form of recursive algorithm to check where are the edges. And then after that, you need to flat view inside this, this stuff that's enclosed. And you know, this is so hard for a program to do. Uh, it will take like 10, 20 lines of program to do this. Uh, but for the humans, when you look at it, you just say, hey, this is an object. I'm just going to fill it in. So Arc Challenge is very hard for computers because the way that um, it's processed by computers is quite different from the way humans process images. And yeah, I think Arc Challenge is, uh, itself is meant to make it hard for programs or make it hard for computers. So in this case, I just this just to give you a flavor of what the Arc Challenge is. Uh, unfortunately, the Arc Challenge is not just about filling in the objects. There's like 1,000 over different skill sets. Each problem is testing a different skill set that is not tested before in the earlier parts. So it's like asking you to go for the exam. Let's say I teach you concept one. I teach you concepts one to 400 in class. But I test you on concepts 801 to 1000 that you have never seen before. So it's a bit tough because like, honestly, you can express a lot of different concepts on a grid. And that's why I think the ARC challenge um, may be a little hard to solve because we are not given the right action spaces or skill sets that the agent needs, all right? This is one complaint I have about the ARC challenge. I think it's not transparent enough with what is being tested. And so the distribution between the train 
and the test is quite different. So let me introduce you this uh, solution by Ryan Greenblatt. Ryan Greenblatt. Uh, before I talk about him, any of you have heard about him before over the last few weeks or anything? Okay, um, no one. <laughs> Okay, so, um, but anyway, the main thing is that he claims to have the state-of-the-art performance for Arc Challenge, uh, about 50% on the on the open eval set. And how his solution is, is like this. He's inspired mainly by AlphaCode. Inspired from AlphaCode. And what he did was like this. He first showed um, multiple input representations to the agent. So one input is maybe the image itself. One is a uh, different text for the grid. So you could either show the grid itself into the array. You could show the object positions. Uh, you could show the um, color to cells. So like where the color is and where the cell is. Actually very similar to what I'm doing for the arc challenge as well. So you did do different input views. And also if let's say um, like over here cells occupied by different connected components of colors, um, these are like the objects, right? Then um, we also have the difference between input and output. This is the difference view, which I don't have. But this difference view is something that can tell you what has changed in the grid, provided the grid shapes are the same. So in his pipeline, he has a problem. And then if, let's say, the grid size are the same, you go one side. And if grid size are different, you go another side. So grid sizes the same, then you give difference view. And then if grid sizes are different, you give other views. Uh, of course, I mean, there are other filtering criteria like some if else branches. Uh, I'm not going into the specifics, but you give different views to the problem um, based on what the problem is. So in some sense, it is like telling the, so yeah, I trying to, you are trying to phrase the problem in a way that the LM can understand. Right, according to what kind of problem there is. Okay, because Arc Challenge is unique in the sense that the same grid itself, okay, might actually be talking about different kind of uh, abstraction spaces, like some is individual pixel level, some is at the object level, and so on. So once uh, he has identified which kind of view uh, to use, okay, actually typically the views are all the same for if if the if the it, uh, the only thing difference, <laughs> the different I, I can understand is that there's a difference view if the grid size is the, same, is the same, but for the other views, it's generally all the same. Like you give everything to the agent, right? And what he did was he sampled 8,000 programs per problem, and that's a lot, all right? Okay, granted, Alpha Code sampled 1 million programs per problem, but he sampled 8,000 programs. That's, that's insane. That's, that's a lot of money used. And basically, based on what works for the training set, he just take the top 12 programs, do a refinement step, okay, to get the program to output better. If let's say there's any difference in the tra training set output, like to do a refinement step and then get, and then submit it. So to summarize this solution, multiple sampling plus filtering on one abstraction space and then refine answer. So there's two steps to his problem. So, this is actually quite similar to alpha code in the sense of you multiple sample and filter. Uh, refinement, I'm not too sure that alpha code did it, but refining is quite a big deal of the answer as well. So this is at least how the general problem solver works. And I, I think it's quite cool how he did it. Oh, sorry, questions first before I move on. Uh, any questions you have about this approach? Okay. So the approach here is, as, as what I say, is very similar to alpha code. You give it multiple, uh, uh, sam sample multiple times. You you choose some to to submit, based and this is the graph graph that I said like all AI papers should include. <laughs> it's just one line like that. Like as you sample more and more times. In this case, k is the number of samples. If I'm not wrong, you get more accuracy like that. So the more you sample, the higher the chance of hitting the right solution. So uh, this is a graph that he, uh, this is a diagram that uh, Ryan drew quite humorously. And uh, he said that like, on one cam, neural symbolics say that you cannot just stack the models to get complexity. You need to reason well, but 
on the other hand, LMs just shown that like if you just sample more, maybe you can get the right answer. Okay, but I, I would like to say actually both camps are, uh, can, can be combined because honestly, uh, if you use LM with code, you know, code is actually uh, a, a bit of neuro symbolic, right? Because you actually, you use some logical relations and so on, you know, like, so actually it's, it's, it's both. Yeah, if you just use LM without the code, um, then, then maybe, you know, you may not be able to solve this problem as well. So I think you need both approaches. But the key thing of today's talk or session is to say that just given the right views, all right, just sampling is enough to improve the the, the software. Rate. And that's that's amazing because um he did, did do a calculation, like I, I think he calculated he needs a few billion samples <laughs> to solve it. Yeah. So so if you actually have enough samples, you might already be able to solve this problem this way. Okay, but the drawbacks, uh he spent about 40,000 to get this 8,000 samples per question. And I don't think that's feasible for, for AI right now. And I'm quite sure the latency is quite slow also. So let's talk about my solution. Okay, my solution and Ryan's solution is also about sampling, but uh, it's a little different. He samples the same agent all the time. I sample agents with different views. So like one agent, I only give it great view, maybe one agent give it object view, one agent give it pixel view. And I realized that, you know, you shouldn't just give all views at the same time. Because if you give all views at the same time, the chance of the agent stumbling on the right solution is lower. Right? And you know, you, so you kind of want to mix and match. Um, you can give an agent a grid view, an object view, pixel view, and so on. And I sample it three times per agent. So it's about 60 per problem only uh, compared to 8,000. I solve about like 45% of the public training set. Um, he solved about 70%. So, I mean, there's a difference in the scores, but that's because I did not really optimize. I only did it one time and that's it. It was just meant as a test to see whether there's multiple agents with different views work. And the answer I got is that it worked, right? If you give all the same views and all put in the same agent, the solve rate will be much lower. Okay, this one I, I've tested empirical, empirically. I, I don't have a number for it, but you can just take my word for it. Like if you just cram all the action spaces plus views in the same agent, you get lower soft rate. So, you know, if you could take Ryan's solution and you can combine with mine, I think you will get an improvement in soft rate in up challenge already. All right, so this is what I'm saying. Uh, my solution over here wasn't uh, perfect either because I did not constrain action spaces. So like for an agent with the grid view, I also give it the object view and the pixel view functions. Okay, so on hindsight, I should only constrain, like if I give you certain views, then I should give you certain functions. So my my uh, insight is that if you have the right ab abstraction spaces, you should also have the relevant action spaces only to those abstraction spaces. Okay, so it's a little complicated here, but the idea is like this. You know, uh, we go back to the earlier example of putting balls into cups, all right? So, in my abstraction space to your input view, I give you the cup position, the ball position, and I give you the action to put the ball in the cup. Okay. I don't need to give you actions like draw a picture, create Python programs. I don't need to give you these actions because you are not given those input views to process those. Like if I want you to draw a picture, I should give you the input views that tell you where the picture is, what color palettes you have, but I don't give you those views. Then those action spaces are useless to you. Like you don't even know how to use them. So um, in my rudimentary solution, where I did this last year, I just gave all action spaces to the agents uh, for convenience. But uh, if I were to rerun this program again, I would constrain the views and I would constrain the actions based on those views only. I think this will increase the software rate easily for the solution. Okay. And I would say this sampling with agents with different views and different actions this is an advancement over alpha code. Okay, because alpha code just conditions on metadata tags. Okay, it does not do input views nor action spaces. So if you constrain your agent based on what the agent can see and what the agent can do, and you just sample different agents that are biased differently. I think the chance of you hitting the correct solution is much higher. 
Okay, uh, I talked quite a lot. Um, any questions or clarification so far for this? Uh, yeah, John, just real quick. I do remember reading your um, multiple expert agents research paper, but I didn't, I don't think I got into like the exact implementation of like the sampling. Uh, was it all sequential? Like you just ran out of, ran the prompts into like your uh, API okay. and you, you just ran it one at a time or how did you run it? Yes. Uh, so in order to get my paper out, I spent two days not sleeping much. I copy paste the thing into the chat GPT web interface and copy paste the answer out. So it was sequential. Uh, and it was not just sequential, it was very manual because I didn't have the money to use the API. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you just sat there copy and you had to copy and paste for each agent one at a time, right? Yeah, it was very painful. Oh jeez. Okay. Yeah, I but respect. if I had money to run the APIs, I would have done what Ryan did, uh, do the async and stuff to run all in parallel. Yeah, um, that would have saved a lot of time and I could I could sample a bit more also. Mm. Yeah, but just this manual copy paste can already get the answer like 45%. That's quite impressive. Very, yeah. <laughs> I actually uh I mean just to set the record clear, like I didn't actually sample 60 per problem. Uh Although I put in the paper, I sampled 60 per problem. The actual fact is once the answer has been reached, I just stopped for the question. Just, I don't, let's say I get the answer in the first try. You know, I, I don't have to repeat another 59 more times to copy and paste. <laughs> so yeah, so there's a bit of caveat here. I did not actually sample the full 60. I just sample until the solution is met. Okay. So I think this view is very important. Uh, keep this view in mind because this is the bedrock of a lot of ideas. Okay, and of course, after the filtering step, there's also a refinement step and so on, which um, I, I did not go through, but I also did a refinement. So multiple sampling and filtering, and then refinement. Th These two ideas, very important. Sampling filter and refinement based on the output. The iterative refinement can solve a lot of problems. Okay, iterative refinement. So iterative refinement, if you are interested to to know more about this, um, you can either look at my paper or you can take a look at other papers like Reflection um, that basically takes the output of the agent after solving a text world or not solving a text world and then ask the agent to reflect on itself. And, and you, based on Reflection, it's shown to improve performance a lot. So this iterative refinement is a very important step as well. So now we move on to a bit more advanced topics. So just now when we were talking about sampling, we were thinking about more of the mini columns kind of sampling, right? Like um, you have different mini columns. Okay, maybe each mini column has its own biases, own action spaces and so on, like how I did for the art challenge. Or each mini column should, could be all the same with the same action spaces, same views and so on. You know, you could, you could sample the same agent multiple times, or you could sample different agents with different biases multiple times. So these are the key takeaways from what we did earlier. And all this can be done in parallel. And you just take what works best based on some validator or heuristic or evaluator. And then after that, you refine those best answers. So if I were to summarize the earlier few slides, uh, this is the summary. Okay, you either sample the same agent multiple times or you sample different agents multiple times each and just take what works best. So again, this is the analogy about throwing the ball at the dartboard. You can throw a lot of times at the same dartboard if you already know the position. <clears throat> but if you don't know the position of the dartboard, maybe you throw a bit some to the left, some to the right, some to the top, some to the bottom. And hopefully one works. Um, that's sampling the different agents with different biases. You know, if you already know the bias beforehand, you could just do the first step. Right. So these are the different kind of things that we could do. And yep, the main thing is do what works well for the problem. And with that in mind, let's take a look at the later few sampling techniques that could potentially help to improve the solution accuracy. So instead of maybe sampling the same agent multiple times, maybe there's a better way, you know, or instead of sampling all agents with different biases multiple times. Maybe there's a better way to choose the agent to sample. So let me just pause here for a while. Could we, uh, let me just use a different color. Could we choose the agent according to some 
previously. So instead of doing repeated sampling with the same agent or repeated sampling with multiple agents, could we use some form of meta knowledge to choose the agent we want to invest our resources to sample on? So assuming that we only have a finite amount of compute, which we do in the brain or, in, or whatever place that we are computing, we want to prioritize our search efforts to those that actually yield results. And that's this whole section on more efficient sampling. So let's uh, do not be a bit overwhelmed by the technical aspects here. Just focus on the broad ideas, all right? Okay, so I, I know you'll be a bit overwhelmed if you've seen this for the first time, but these are the two traditional searches that like a computer scientist would know, a breakfast search and a deathfast search. Okay, what does this mean in general? Okay, it means that when you have a lot of things to search for, there are two techniques that we can use to search. Okay, one is maybe breakfast search. So let's use the example of tic-tac-toe, all right? So the starting node is maybe zero. Maybe you put an X at the center. This is starting node zero. And then you could search breath-wise, like one, two, three, right? So you could either search this part here, Like you could search a graph with an O over here. That could be the second node. That, that, this one could be number one. And then you can search for number two. I'm just going to draw one and two for simplicity because uh, it, it's taking a while for me to draw this. <laughs> so this is node one, this is node two, this is node zero. And then, you know, like node four, node four is the expansion of this one. So node, node four could be here. X, O, and maybe like we have an X here. Yeah, and note five, okay, that's to draw one example of note five. All right, I hope this is clear. So basically you can see that like, these nodes, uh, node zero links to node one and node, node one links to node one and node five. Okay, but in order to search maybe like which program works the best, you know, I don't actually do all searches all the time. Like one way is I could generate all possible outputs for, for this source node zero. I can generate all possible outputs of all possible bot positions. Okay, but that might be a bit too hard to generate. Uh, I mean, what I could do is I maybe can gen generate like three of them. Okay, and then I just search through one by one like that. Okay, and then after that, for each of them, I generate a few more and then I search through. So your search, would, breakfast search will look like this. I, I draw in red color. Breakfast search would search this one, then this one, then this one. Okay, we search all the same depth of the tree first. Then we move on to the next step and next step and next step. And uh, this is useful for problems that the answer is pretty shallow. So if you are sure that your answer is like maybe in two moves or what, then you might want to spend more efforts to search the entire breath. Okay, so what is that first search? That first search is like, you know, if you want to solve a chess problem, like you want to know which piece to move, right? Sometimes the answer lies in multiple steps ahead. Like the answer is rarely in two steps. The answer is like quite deep. So maybe what you do is you just run all the way to the end of this and then you backtrack and then you run here again and then you backtrack again. So the way you search for that first search is like this. That first search should be like this, this orange color. I hope this is clear. So this is that first search. So what is that first search used for? That first search is usually used for problems where you need to, where the answer is very deep in the tree. Okay, and then you just want to identify a promising branch to look and then you look deep. So that's that first search. Uh, question so far for breakfast search and that first search? Okay, that's good. So I, I hope this was clear. So this is an idea of 
instead of sampling all in parallel, we focus, especially if the answer requires you to sample from an intermediate node, you can sample some more, you know. We want to focus on those paths that are most promising. And we can either use this strategy, prefer search, deficit search. And in fact, if you're interested, you can also check out the A star search method, which is the same as a uh, like ref, sorry. A star search is like is is actually search with some heuristic. Yeah. So it's like you can add some heuristics to bias which nodes to select. So that's like A star search. It, so there are different search techniques that could be used to solve problems. And uh, Tree of Thought is a paper that actually tries to implement breakfast search and deficit search to solve problems. And the idea that they have is like this. You know, the usual kind of prompting that you have is just one branch. Like you take your input, you ask for some thoughts, and then you go to another thoughts and so on until you reach the end. Okay, there's other stuff like self-consistency where you sample multiple thoughts and you get the majority view. So this is the multiple sampling and filtering part. So what if we can do something a little more targeted? Um, we can not just sample breath-wise like that. We could maintain, like we can take the first samples of this branch like that. Okay, assuming we are doing like a form of breath -first search thing. We could then have an external validator to say that, hey, which, which are not good. We only keep the top two maybe. Okay, then based on the top two, we expand out some more, okay? And we go to maybe this next layer. And then we have a validator that says, hey, this one uh, is not good, this one is not good, this one is not good. And then we move on to the next step. Yeah, so th this is the, this is the breakfast search tree approach for train of thought. And basically at each level of the tree, they identify X number of nodes. In this case, X is two or K is two. And they expand those nodes again and they evaluate and expand again and evaluate and so on. So this basically says that, you know, instead of like, because if you were to search randomly down the path, that's, the tree expands out quite widely, widely. So instead of just doing this search, maybe we want to do a more targeted approach at each level of the tree. Okay, we just prune out those nodes that we think are not good. So you kind of need a, a validator here. Evaluator needs to be good. Okay, to prune out notes. Okay, because if you prune out wrongly, that's it. Your solution is gone, lost forever. If I if my solution is in this red color, in this red color thought bubble, I'm 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 I effectively lost the solution when I prune it out. So you could do um, uh, hopefully the evaluator is good enough. Um, usually it should be in the form of some ground truth, like you know, up problem training sets or competitive problems tra uh, training set. Like um, it should already be given to you. If not. If you use an LM as an evaluator, there's a chance that you might prune out wrongly. So uh, I mean, in, in the stuff that they did for Tree of Thought, they did crossword puzzles, Game of 24, all this have an external evaluator because you know for sure if your ground truth works, you will get 24 maybe for the Game of 24. So this is something that I need to highlight. A lot of papers do reflection or evaluation based on LMs. Okay, if you use evaluate, or reflect based on LMs, you can prune wrongly. Very, very important. Because if you prune wrongly, that's it, uh, gone. You have lost your solution right there. So Tree of Thought uh, uses an external evaluator that is very much deterministic to just prune the trees so that you only focus on the relevant search areas. And then you continue, and then you prune again. So you can either prune it in the breath way, or you could prune it in the depth way. All right, so um, those are different methods to implement it. But the idea is this thing called focus on what is relevant and attack it. So if you look later, at, I, I have a slide on alpha goal, alpha zero. So the idea is philosophy is like this. Focus on what works best based on available info and search there. So, you know, in the earlier part of multiple sampling and filtering, we are searching the entire forest. Like, you just search it multiple times. But right now, for like stuff like Tree of Thought with breakfast search and deficit search, we are only focusing on path, on paths that are most promising based on some evaluator. And this, with the same amount of compute, okay, this might actually help us to, um, to, to actually search the right answer better. So that's Tree of Thought. 
I, I pause here for any questions because the next part will be a, a little more complicated than three of thought. All good. Can you just give some indication whether the explanation is understandable? Okay, good. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce you this idea called uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search. And this is a search that is quite different from all the other earlier searches. Okay, in the other searches, we only exploit. Okay, what do you mean by exploit? Okay, so I have to give you the famous example that I always use for Monte Carlo Tree Search. We have a chicken rice and we have duck rice. Okay, I don't have the image for this right now, but <laughs> imagine you have a chicken rice and duck rice. You know, like some days you eat chicken rice, some days you eat duck rice. But let's say chicken rice you eat one time is given a value of 10, a point 10. Wow! Then I keep, I may want to keep eating chicken rice all the time, but you know, in real world solutions, things might change. The world is dynamic. You may not want to eat chicken rice the whole time because like, what if the value of chicken rice, you know, kind of drops to like maybe 6.10? And then this value here is unknown. Do you want to just keep eating chicken rice all the time? Because like if the value is unknown, maybe you can treat it as value zero. You know, you don't want to eat that one. You just keep eating chicken rice all the time. It, that, that may not be the wise choice because maybe maybe the value here is uh, 9.10 maybe. Okay, maybe let's uh, refine the initial example. You eat chicken rice, you get a value of six. And then you might think that, hey, it's, it's nice. Let's eat it. Let's keep eating it but you miss out that dark rice might be actually nicer to you. Yep. So in the real world, this uh, real world is dynamic. Value keeps changing. And you know, you don't want to commit too much to one solution. So what do you do? Okay, actually humans are quite good at this. Uh, after a while, if you eat chicken rice enough times, okay, you try this, you keep eating chicken rice every day, you'll be sick of it. Okay, most people would be sick of it. Like if I give you ice cream, you, everyone loves ice cream. But I mean, most people love ice cream. You keep eating ice cream, you'll be sick of it after a while. So we have a way to have another parameter. So this is the exploit value. We have another way to explore value. Okay, which means that if let's say I keep like number of times for chicken rice, let's say the, the number of times I eat chicken rice is 10. And the number of times I eat duck rice is zero. You know, after a while, there might there must be some inclination to ask you to try dark rice because your know, explore is not uh you haven't explored before maybe out of curiosity you know something very interesting maybe I want to go to dark rice, so uh Monte Carlo tree search is operating on this principle. You have an exploit term, and then you have a weighting factor plus an exploration term. Uh, times and exploration term. So the exact details are not important because uh, people have tried hundreds of variations of this as long as you have an exploit and explore somewhere and you can guarantee that all nodes can be explored eventually, you have your Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. Uh, so essentially each of these nodes in the graph okay, will have a will have this uh, Monte Carlo tree search value. Let's call it uh, V. V equals to this exploit term plus exploration term. So every node has a V. Okay, what we want to do is at the start here, we choose the node with the highest V and then we choose the nodes with the highest V and then so on until we reach the end. Uh, it's called a leaf node. And then at the leaf node, what we do is we expand it out to, to form another node, like basically take another action. Uh, we might simulate it multiple times all the way to get the answer and, and come back. Like in the game of Go, you might simulate it. Uh, but more recently, people have found that, you know, just using a heuristic to um, approximate V, may be better because you know when you do the simulation of running the game or what it might it might get a wrong answer like you might think you might get a you might lose the game but actually you should be in a winning state it's just that your simulation is not good yeah so when you get this updated value what we'll do usually is that we take this updated value and then we'll just pass back this value upwards all the way and uh, essentially the back propagation step is just to like average out all values so if you have run the simulation let's say you have run three child nodes, like the value is like seven, eight, nine, then your value of the node is nine, is eight, is the average. Usually the back propagation means you average out the values. And so this like sort of biases your search to, you know, okay, this uh 
maybe I don't call it V, uh, because actually this is not the exploration, this is actually the exploit term. Uh, maybe we call this uh, E, let's call this term E. So you will actually get the exploit term, and the exploit term will be back propagated all the way here to update the, the values of the exploit term. Okay, so I've run through a little bit more in depth than I would have liked. <laughs> so the idea is explore and exploit. You not only want to find out the action that will give you the highest value, you also want to try out other actions that might potentially give you good value, but you know, you just don't want to keep doing the great action all the time. You want to give some chance for the other actions. So you kind of need to balance between how much you exploit and how much you explore, you know? Like for cases whereby maybe your first action is already good enough, maybe you don't need to explore. Then you don't, you, oops, I, I put this thing a bit wrongly. Like you need to weigh based on your, in, in your, based on the certain scenario, whether or not you want to exploit more or whether or not you want to explore more. It really depends on how much exploration is needed. So this is a more customizable search that focuses on what could be potentially good. And you know, if you have a very good evaluator here, if this is a super solid good evaluator, you know, it can, uh, can bias your search very well. So same thing for three of thought, you need a very good evaluator. If your evaluator is not good, forget it, forget it. Don't do three of thought, don't do multi color tree search. Just do multiple sampling and filtering. Questions so far for this? Okay, all good. So what is Monte Carlo tree search used for? So I'm sure you have heard of AlphaGo or Alpha Zero, where you know it beat Lee Sedo, AlphaGo beat Lee Sedo in 2016, and it was the key reason why I joined AI, because I thought we would be already reaching that, like superhuman AI and stuff. Uh, I was quite wrong. I don't think we're there yet. We are not there anytime, at least until um, the ideas that I'm trying to build on multiple sampling, filtering, multiple agents, multiple populations, like unless we can do all these ideas, we won't reach superhuman AI for all domains, okay? We will only reach for narrow domains, like what um, Alpha Zero has done for Go, all right? Or Chess and Shogi also. So what Monte Carlo Tree Search is used for is in Alpha Go and Alpha Zero, um, to keep things a little more broad, they have two networks. One is a policy network and one is a value network. And the policy network just tells you, you know, what states to search, what are uh, promising states to search. So you bias your search based on the policy network. And the, the value network will tell you what states end up good, end up well. So, you know, it's a, it's a heuristic to tell you like whether or not the, the node is good. So actually, to be honest, the policy and the value networks are kind of similar because like what states are good to search is normally what states will end up well as well. So, you know, maybe you could combine both. Uh, but in Alpha um, Zero, Alpha Go, they have two networks and um, they basically update both networks. This value network to the value of the end result will be updated here. So basically, at each step, you're trying to predict the end result. And at the policy network, based on the Monte Carlo tree search, we are also trying to update the Monte Carlo tree search one to whatever values that was predicted by the raw neural network. So Monte Carlo tree search is used as a policy and the value network improvement operator here. And because of the nature of search, you know, normally when you can do look ahead search, the value will be better than you just using a neural network to predict the outcomes. And you know, by making the prediction more and more closer to the actual Monte Carlo tree search outcome, you're actually making your algorithm or this neural network better at predicting the future. So this is one way to use Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, I think this kind of method is very flimsy, actually. I've tried AlphaGo and AlphaZero. Um, if your value network and policy networks are biased wrongly at the beginning, you will not be able to learn well. Okay, that's one thing. That's why I stopped working on AlphaGo and AlphaZero. I think it's not the way ahead. Okay. And the second thing is if environment changes, your PNV may be wrongly biased. You learn even slower than if you did not know about PNV. So there are two complaints or two um, problems about AlphaGo and AlphaZero is that they are not adaptable. 
And in my entire PhD, I spent four years trying to think of how to conquer this problem. And the solution was learning fast and slow. Basically, we don't have a value network. We don't do reward-based prediction. We do goal-based prediction. And you know, this basically means that as your environment change, you just need to update your goal and everything will work well. Like you don't have to relearn the B. Okay. Um, but for the case of goal, you know, the B is very important. Like your end outcome is very important. You want to win. So this alpha zero is great for two players, zero sum games. But it's not great if you need to learn in the real world with arbitrary tasks and so on. This is not the solution. Right. So um let's so I, I spent a lot of time saying why alpha zero is bad, but they use something good. And the thing that they use well is this Monte Carlo tree search. Because of Monte Carlo tree search, it's able to learn and refine and do well in an environment. So I haven't talked about this before, but sampling and filtering can help to achieve optimality, like um, closer and closer to optimality. And you know, if you could bootstrap your learning on uh, MCTS or whatever search, you can get better systems. And this is very important because I think this is the path ahead to superhuman intelligence, uh, not the alpha zero way with policy and value networks, but just simply using a large language model or some system that can generate different outcomes, bias it differently, do the Monte Carlo tree search or whatever search you need, get the best answer by some evaluator. And this evaluator is very important. Get some answer by this evaluator. And then you can use that as the memory for subsequent iterations you will get a self-improving agent um, that may or may not self-improve, but at least it will improve based on what all the other agents that it has generates. So the more agents it has, the higher the chance that you can find something better than what it currently has and it can improve itself. So this is the recipe for self-improvement. Uh, for those curious, you can check the, the road, to, road, road to AI part three, that, uh, roadmap to AI part three that I've uh, have covered quite in depth about this. Uh, but the main thing, the Monte Carlo tree search or whatever search, like by just having the search be biased in a certain end result that, uh, I mean, but to bias in a certain end result that you want, you can potentially get better and better paths there. Okay, so sampling and filtering, very, very powerful. Next, we talk about MCTSR. And MCTSR is using uh, Lama 38B and just using the Monte Carlo tree search method to search promising nodes expand them and refine them, you can actually get quite good performance. Like you see, just by using MCTSR with eight rollouts, you know, you can really do better than zero shot. Of course, you can see like the self-refine step is like, is awesome. So refinement is very important. So the details I won't be able to go through because of the lack of time, but the idea is that you expand out most promising node based on exploit and exploit. Okay, then you give you give it a value by a heuristic. And then you back propagate values to parent nodes. So essentially, it is doing what Monte Carlo Tree Search is doing. And uh, it is choosing a node. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say something. Refine the node. Okay, so every, every step when you expand it, we also refine it. And this basically makes the node more and more powerful and more relevant. Like in this case, solving math questions, the, the node will be closer and closer to the right answer. And you can give a certain heuristic to evaluate the node. Um, you could use maybe a language model. Yeah, I mean, or you can, in this case, I don't agree that LM should be used for math. Maybe you should have a math evaluator to evaluate whether the answer is correct. Uh, maybe you could um, encode the problem in a computer program and we can run the computer program to see whether the output is correct. That, that could be the heuristic. Yeah, we shouldn't use LM to be the heuristic for math. I, I don't think it's very reliable. Okay. Um, but that aside, you know, this MCTSR by expanding out the most promising node, refining it, and in general using the exploit and exploit to choose the next node, I think this is very promising. Okay, questions so far. I, I know I exceeded a bit, but uh, let's end this in five, 10 minutes. Uh, any questions? Okay, good. So this is my thoughts on all these advanced search methods. I, I'm saying that, yes, uh, breadth of search, depth of search, you know, uh, you can use tree of thought, or, you know, if you add a heuristic, you can use A star. You know, there's so many different methods 
that you can use to search. <laughs> all these methods are good. But I think all these methods are very slow. Okay, so very slow. Okay, most of these methods, if you look, you need to find a, a step to evaluate. Then after that, choose the best nodes, then expand, evaluate, choose the best nodes. So it is very sequential. You kind of need to, to know like what are the best nodes. You also need to compare all the states to know which is the best. So all these comparison operations take time, you know, they, they don't come for free. Like the best comparison operation, like maybe we are doing sorting or something is oh n log n. Yeah, that's quick sort. All right. There, there might be better ways to sort, but you know, it still takes time. And this is the kind of thing that we don't have in the brain. Like when we make decisions, it's more or less split second. If our brain were to use breakfast search, deficit search, Monte Carlo tree search, I think it'll be eaten up by the by the snake or the tiger when we see it. Okay, because uh, it might take too long to search. Okay. However, I mean, you could also do like asynchronous operations or parallel operations, okay, using threading or something. You could set like a node value to be super low or something so that you can avoid um, other people adjusting the values when it's calculated. Uh, then you can do like Monte Carlo tree search in parallel. That's a mitigating factor. Uh, but in general, if you talk about response time and speed, Using this advanced search methods, while it could potentially increase the uh, chance of finding the right solution by constraining quite well in the path, okay, you just take too long to do it in, in the brain. I, I don't think the brain actually uses that. I think the brain uses more of like parallel searches with biases, like what I did in the up challenge, because you, you don't really need to do an evaluation step, then do the next step and so on. Like all the steps here, you kind of need to evaluate then choose the next one. It's, it's a bit too too long. And yeah, another thing, you may not have the evaluator. <laughs> in, in the real world, you see, like not like math problems, you know the answer and so on. Programming problems, you know the answer. Like in the real world, you may not have an evaluation function that you can use to prune the notes. So maybe what the brain is doing or at least what I think the brain is doing, the um, multiple parallel search with different biases, uh, you don't quite need the ground truth. All you need to do is like at the end, maybe you just check which solution is most similar to what you need. Yeah, or maybe, um, I mean, there could be different ways to do semantic matching and so on. Uh, there are different ways to do it. Uh, maybe we also do a form of um, value-based checks. I, I don't know. I, I really don't think we have anything to do with value-based checks. Uh, if anything, it will be whether or not the outcome you predict satisfy your bodily concerns, <laughs> that, or uh, at least the goal that you have thought of. Um, yeah, I really think it's, it's not that advanced because it's very hard to come up with the evaluator. And to do that for arbitrary problems is not possible. Okay, maybe it's, it's, it's possible for goal, for math Olympiad problems, you have a ground truth. In the real world, I'm hungry. I have to eat something. Is there a ground truth? Do you always eat the yogurt in your fridge? Do you always eat the banana in your fridge or on your table? No? <laughs> Put for thought, all right? I mean, that's why I don't think we do stuff like breakfast search, breakfast search or Monte Carlo tree search in the brain. But for specific problems, maybe they are useful. Okay, I know I exceeded a bit of the time. Uh, I'd like to move on to the last part, which is, I think, the most interesting part. So these are the questions to ponder. I'm going to give my answer. And if you have any answers, feel free to, to chip in, all right? So first question, can sampling help if the model does not know how to generate the answer? Okay, my answer is no. Okay, you can only generate something you know. So if let's say in the up challenge, I test you on uh, filling squares inside the boundary, or filling rectangles in the boundary. If you have no idea what a boundary is, there's no chance you'll get the right answer. I mean, even if you do random sampling, maybe you might get the right answer. Okay, maybe I put the answer is probably no. Yeah, okay, unless you are lucky. To generate by other means. Okay. So the thing is in the throwing the ball case to hit the bullseye, if you don't know that your target is behind you. All right, if the target is behind you and you don't know about it, I keep throwing forward. I will probably not hit the target at the back unless it rebounds from the front and hit the back by luck. That's the analogy. Uh, yeah, 
Uh, now, now, you, you have anything to add? We, uh, you have been a bit quiet. I kind of like a bit more discussion, if possible. Uh, anyone? So, in this analogy, so how would a human go about? Because humans are problem solvers. Like, like to quote Plato, we we don't know what we don't know, but we know how to find out what we don't know. If that makes sense. Like, even if I kept throwing rebounding all day, I guess I never knew it existed. I mean, there's, I guess this, it goes back to the explore exploit question, where it's like, I keep doing the same thing over and over again. But eventually, if you program a type of explore or a type of curiosity into the agent, eventually the agent will be like, you know, I keep doing this every day and not hitting anything. I wonder, you know, what's beyond this? <laughs> you know, like when you're stuck, like when you're stuck in the, like, Another good Greek example is the the cave where it's like the shadows underground. And that's all those humans know. It's like the cave uh, shadow puppetry until they go out and explore the real world. All they know is the uh, 2D representation. And they have to go actively explore. Otherwise, they'll never know it's there. But humans do have like a, for, storm, uh, a form of programming that allows for that. I don't know what it is exactly in the neural circuitry, but there's definitely that explore. Um, I guess the question is how the agent would go about encoding that new knowledge or that new curiosity. I don't know how you go about it with like maybe like an LM agentic, agentic framework. If you prompt it or if it's more lower at like the encoding level at the vector level, I'm not entirely sure. It could be a little bit, you know, mix and match. Thanks for the answer. I, I do agree with your points that after a while, the agent doesn't get what he wants. The agent will realize, hey, I'm doing something wrong. And actually, if you look at GPT-40, like sometimes when I ask it to do a task using task gen, like after it tries three actions, it might think that, hey, um, this function is not very good. I should use another function. I actually got this kind of thinking on its own. So... I do think that there's some form of reflection in terms of what has been done and then using that to recalibrate future actions. But the thing is, if you have no action space for it, <laughs> that, uh, that can generate right answer, you never will. So um, this is something I think I, I think you also agree. Like um, it's the famous picture where you, you know you ask the fish to climb a tree. I mean, the, the fish will never be able to climb the tree unless it got lucky and the bird lifts it up there or lifts it up there. But if not, if your action space don't match the kind of outcome that you need, no matter how you search, you will never get there, simply put. And humans somehow have the ability to generate new action spaces that can reach there. So I think that's something that is interesting. Like, how do we learn new action spaces on the go? I, I think this is a question that is unsolved. I, I've been trying to think of this question also to solve the app challenge. I haven't come up with the answer for it. Like, how do we learn what is a good action to learn? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, one way is just learn everything that you don't know, but that will increase your action space a lot. And yeah, that, that's something that I think we need further thought in it. So thanks for bringing up this question. Yeah. I hope I answered along the same lines as what you were asking or what you were what you were sharing, Derek. No, you hit exactly where I'm getting at. It's <laughs> like we, we don't know what we don't know, but we know how to explore enough to like get at it. And honestly, I think it's just a actually I see the question later about the uh you know tree searching and all that. I I think that humans innately do pattern matching, the parallel pattern matching within the midi columns, and we just find the best solution. It's not optimal or whatever. <laughs> But I can say for certain, like in my mind, if I really need an exact solution and it's very in-depth and I really need to explore, I will spend a long time on a very specific kind of chain of thought or like depth, right? Like when you plan something really in-depth, you get really immersed in your own thoughts. Have you ever done that where like you're really intensely daydreaming something? Yeah, I, I do that all the time. Like when yeah. I'm doing something. So I'm not saying it's exactly you know, like tree pruning or whatever, but it's a very crude kind of circuitry that somewhat mimics it. It's still very much pattern matching, 
but like you're you're intensifying a specific line of parallel uh what do you call it um Basically, you are, you are prioritizing a certain branch in the tree to, to double down yeah on research. yeah you like you're like intensifying you're going like way deeper into the depth of it That's a great so point. so i think that's what allows us to kind of like when we really intensify a certain possibility we discover something new from it and then we use that new new knowledge to explore another possibility that we didn't have access to before because we had to first reach that possibility from the initial kind of midi column if that makes sense mm -hmm. so you like you kind of like step by step nudge towards this new thing that you've never thought of before because you had to get there step by step you know mini column by mini column kind of and then you have to you had to kind of like create that new knowledge step by step All right I, I love the thing and actually that's the next question that i would like to discuss is is our system do a more deliberative thinking like what daniel kahneman said is it simply just readjusting your search like mm -hmm. initially might you might want to search for like let's say google search right you search for chocolate ice cream and then you get back answers that are not that great then maybe you want to search for like uh, ice cream that contains sweet <laughs> sweet uh sweet uh i mean ice cream that contains uh chocolate maybe maybe this will give you a better search because like it, it extracts right memories relevant memories and so on or in this case extract right google worries and then after a while you realize that maybe you know people don't use the word chocolate in this anymore maybe you use a uh, brown ice cream and and then after that you hit correct search yeah maybe, maybe you you based on what you learn from the earlier uh, searches or thoughts you might get new insights about what might be needed to search for and then you double down on that something like that could explain why we will need some form of deliberate thoughts to plan and to, because you need to know what has happened before. You need to plan what has happened. Uh, you need to use what has happened before to condition what to do next. It's like in past gen, you have subtask completed, which is the history. And then you use that to um, condition on what action to do next. Okay, so touching the difference is that we actually don't really have this uh, action space learning, but I mean, it could be done if needed. So maybe if let's say you realize that search is not the right way, you might do a new action. You might do a new action. Yeah, so this is uh, not Soviet. I think the way of getting new actions is, is very difficult. But at least I think more deliberate thinking could be the way to bias your search mechanism. Okay. Rather than doing stuff like, you know, breakfast search revalidation, deficit search revalidation, Monte Carlo tree search revalidation, you know, I, I I don't think we do have the resources to like validate multiple branches at one time. Like the validation part is actually quite intense on compute resources. Most likely what we're doing is uh, we're doing parallel search on one branch and then we pick another branch to do parallel search on. <laughs> so something like what you said there. Yeah, I, I think that might be the better approach than using what people are doing for Tree of Thought or like MCTSR and so on. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not quite it's not quite like tree searching, but it's basically it's like an intensification of like the normal parallels uh search where you do your first search and then you take the best one that pattern matches, do another parallel search from that. So it's kind of like tree noting, but it's much more crude. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean to put it in, in, <clears throat> in a diagram form it could be like that this is your initial stuff I mean it's not even a tree it's just like different nodes all around then you can search this is your search one your search one you start from this initial node and then you just branch out so maybe like in competitive programming case you start with this you search for problems related to graph graph um, difficulty 1500 1400 and so on you could search for all this and you know get and Python and then you you get some answer and then based on the answer then you think okay maybe I need to readjust my search I should do something else so your search tool will be somewhere here and then you ask for different kind of uh, like you search for different kind of parameters like yeah oops <laughs> so basically then you can ask for like uh, this could be math difficulty eight hundred see I mean, you, you, I mean based on what you got from earlier you search differently and so on and i i think this helps to 
like one one thing um slow about the human brain is that you know we need to do this more or less step by step i mean there's no way that you can do deliberate thoughts on five things at the same time i i, I at least i haven't done it if you have done five like maybe math equation you can calculate five equations in your head at the same time do let me know i'm very interested to find out what, what's happening yeah but <laughs> at least for me i only can do one at a time <laughs> no, I and humans, it's it's already been p proven over and over again in psychology. They do all kinds of like tests. Um, when you know, in humans multitask, it's not multitasking. Humans say we are really good at multitasking, but we are not multitasking at all. We are not doing anything <laughs> at the same time. It's all sequential. But the beauty of humans and like how we drive a car and why machines have such a hard time is we don't put that co much compute into it. It's very inaccurate compute but it's very quick compute we switch tasks so quickly so like if you pay attention to the way you drive your your attention f switches so quickly like it, it just snaps almost like you just go from look at the wheel real quick and then you immediately snap to like something you notice like a car incoming mm -hmm. and then you immediately snap back to the front of the road and you just you're i guess the way your mind handles it is that it just constantly focuses this attention from one task to another in a logical order that's worked in the past, right? Because, you know, we learn like that, how to drive, how to do things and condition ourselves. But it switches between them so easily that we don't notice it. We aren't aware of it because it's our inner muscle memory, kind of like our amygdala, just kind of handling the processing for us. It does the switching for us. We just kind of engage that agent it's like hey i'm in driving mode i need to pay attention to my surroundings and it does the rest it just switches its attention basically and we're not aware of it we just kind of observe our environment we kind of experience the motions but that's all handled by like these uh smaller agents in our body that does the switching for us so i think the same should apply here is that the switching itself should be very compute efficient mm. it should it should be very intense tree searching it should just be sort of just kind of like learned i don't know how to explain it. it's kind of like because the neural network part the training the conditioning part should be handled by typical rl or whatever right because the human body does use rl to a degree Kind of just like for like muscle memory and stuff. Minimal RL. I mean, we don't exactly learn by rewards in my opinion, but we learn by association. Of right. I, I guess I should yeah. I should word it better. It's like, it's a very, how do I say it? It's very explorative. It's very expressive. Like we don't have a lot of constraint with our muscle memory. When we first learn something, we just got to try whatever, you know, try to get the hang of it. And then when we start getting the action on, right is based on your past experiences you might match yeah. something related by like riding a bike and riding a scooter maybe you know you've done the same way then you know how to ride a, a, a bike you might be able to ride a scooter straight away uh, but the mm -hmm. same thing does not apply if you know how to ride a scooter you may not know how to ride a bike because bikes you need to balance right so so there are some stuff that you still need to learn if it's different but at least it will match to something that uh, is based on your current memory uh, case in point Whenever you go to the kitchen and you go to the fridge, like sometimes you may be there to like throw rubbish, but if you forgot what you are there for, you might end up going to the fridge and eat, eating something from it because you are very used to opening the fridge to eat it. I mean, most people do that. So the association of the the environment itself could already bias your actions, just like that. Like so, so I I think that's a huge part of semantic matching to memory. Is the efficiency of the constraining? It's like how quickly we're able to constrain our action space and our our attention mechanism. It's just very instant. Like we don't have yeah. anything. We don't have to tree search. We don't have to computate. It's just instant pattern matching. I'm in a kitchen. I can grab a drink. I can cook some ramen. That's it. You don't. You don't even begin to try to like computate how to optimize calories or anything because you just do not care. If you cared, you'd either build a computer to do the math for you, or you'd, you know, get down on a piece of paper, start writing out calories and stuff. But again, that's time and compute for our brain. We have to write all this stuff out. When you're in a kitchen, the context just kills you. Just complete constraint. Here are my things. Here's what I'm going to do. 
and you immediately switch back to like a larger goal. So let's say you're, you know, you're typing up some code or you're at work. Your larger goal is to keep your job, obviously, right? But let's say you notice a context, you see it's 12 o'clock, immediately your brain switches. It switches his attention. It's like, I'm not at work anymore. It's 12 o'clock. We're in lunch mode. It immediately just, just flips it. So I think that's like the power of like the human brain. It's its ability to just flip that attention and flip that uh, context constraint. So I guess so brutally and like so instantly. So it doesn't spend any time computing or trying to like look. It's just pure pattern matching lunch mode. And this is what I can do during lunchtime. And I think that where those actions come from is from the conditioning itself. So that might be involved in uh, the pre-training, um, the data sets, you know, what the LLM learns from uh, whatever data it's uh, abstracting from. And those might actually be what affect what it learns our action spaces. So what things can be done within context. And then the actual control of the, say, the attention or the, uh, the context and constraining these parallels would be something that could be somewhat hard-coded in a framework or whatnot. Mm. You said a lot of main ideas, and uh, I think all this will take a while to, to look through and like see whether what works, what doesn't work. Uh, but let me just yeah. summarize like, what I think based on our discussion. Like What I've got is like this. So the input environment from the world will give you a certain set of priors or some knowledge. And through your system two thinking, you might actually be able to infuse it with some other thoughts, like say, hey, focus more on, on food or focus more on, on math and that kind of stuff. This could form some bias that could do some pattern matching to the relevant memories needed. So like, let's say if you think of food, maybe you think of like, oh, um, stuff that you normally eat, chicken rice, duck rice and stuff. It really bias the memory retrieval aspect. And based on this memory retrieve, you might be able to search the outcome, like using those memory as like conditions, like in context prom or something, you might be able to get different output responses that are in line with those memory. And I think this memory is very important. It's either this memory or you know, this deliberate bias could also go inside this parallel search. Like I, I do think the deliberate mechanism or at least the system two kind of mechanism has a very direct path to influence what you search for. And I mean, the exact mechanisms of this, uh, we have to go and think around a bit, but I, I do think input stimuli plus deliberate thoughts, do some matching with the memory, using memory to condition on the search. I think those are likely what we are doing in the brain. And yeah, so uh, this answers also like how we bias the generation. Like There are different ways to bias. And, you know, if your memory or your thoughts, you know, your memory thoughts, uh, don't con do not have the right bias, you can't generate well for that task. Yeah. So so it's like if you are trying to solve like a question that needs you to count letters, like how many um maybe how many A's are in banana, like but you keep thinking of the fruit in the picture, you will never be able to solve the task. So unless you tell yourself, hey, count the letters or look at the letter view, you, you can't you, you can't get the right answer. So there's a lot of uh, problem solving that is just related to getting the right kind of bias. You can get the right bias, you will solve a very difficult problem in a very simple way. I mean, if you look at history, that, that's how math problems have been solved. A lot of people view them in a different domain and boom, you solve it in that way. Right. So one thing I would like to like conclude on is that while I think humans only can focus on one task at a time, I think we don't have to apply this constraint to computers. Like over here, like initial thought, you search for graph, difficulty 1400 Python. Search two, you search for math, difficulty 800 C. You know, I, I don't think computers need to be constrained like that. Like maybe humans, we need to do to limited compute, but with computers, we can just have many more computers run in parallel and so on. We can all search and, you know, as long as we have a way to validate stuff. Okay, so in, in the brain, likely there's no real way to validate other than, you know, using some form of uh, thoughts again, like using the LM to, to evaluate itself. Yeah, but in a, in a domain with a, with a source of true validation, like math, you know, maybe you could just do everything in parallel, like what people are doing for alpha code, for the MCTSR, you know, you, you might be able to do that. 
Uh, in granted, yes, it's not like the brain, but I mean, it's, it's fine. Like We don't have to mimic the brain 100%. We could get a system that could potentially be better than the brain if you just simply increase your parallel search. And instead of just biasing it, like one bias, like how we would do with deliberate thoughts, we can bias it with five biases, 10 biases, 15 biases, and so on. You could just increase the amount of biases you need, search more, and then as long as you have a way to filter the responses, you would essentially get better searches if you search more. Right. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm about to conclude already. You have any last points you want to make before I just like end off with some words? No, this was a pretty good discussion. I'm sorry, I scared everyone away. It's pretty <laughs> no, late. No, <laughs> yeah. Now this this was the one I was really looking forward to because it was that question you brought up earlier about like um exploring how does an agent uh learn and explore what it can't really know or is it like pre-trained on right has it create that kind of new knowledge that humans are renowned for like how, how we would look at a flying bird and just through this kind of parallel matching system of just like kind of slowly inching towards like more and more pattern matching from different perspectives eventually be like oh okay i could do what that bird does that's not hard I just need to get enough air left, <laughs> right? It's because like, yeah. nor, <laughs> but, nor... But, but you can't just copy because if you just flap your arms like that, you will never fly. Exactly. Like that's just a, that's too basic of a sampling. You know, you just keep trying the same thing over and over again. But if you do a right amount of parallel searching and kind of very, I'll say, uh, compute efficient and like co uh, compute abstract uh, form of like, the uh, abstraction space is important. So if you sample yeah. in the form of like flight, how do you fly? How does the bird create a aerodynamic flight? Then maybe we'll come up with stuff like the airplane or the hot air Yeah. Bird. So it might be sampling and filtering are enough. It's just how you sample. How do I, yeah, how you sample, how you create new abstraction or new action spaces, new abstraction spaces from what you've already sampled and like enable those new perspectives that you want to have had before because at the end of the day the base knowledge is always going to be the same right like i can't think up a new color or a new sound that i've never heard of before but i can think up a new abstraction of it or a new perspective of it that i'd never had before just through pattern matching and parallel search and creating these new kind of abstraction spaces i wouldn't have necessarily known of before if i didn't pattern match with different biases and different ideas. So I think that's the biggest thing is learning, I guess kind of teaching an agent how to create those kind of new perspectives. Mm -hmm. How do we get these agents to create their own abstraction spaces? How do we get them to learn from their pattern matching, learn from their sampling and not just do brute force sampling or brute force tree searching? Because it'll get you there, granted, just be sitting there forever, just kind of copying and pasting <laughs> or, you know, staring at the screen, waiting for it to run its uh, back propagation. So I think that's the most important thing. And I think we'll definitely get a lot closer uh, once we get the hang of that and how we get these agents to kind of pick up on it. Because honestly, LLMs are pretty intelligent, uh, but it's when you get them to do things that are more outside their comfort zone. Like with humans, like we have our own comfort zones with things, but we have that natural desire and curiosity for things where we're okay with, you know, giving away our comfort and our natural uh, instant answers and, you know, kind of coming up with these, these new ideas oh, in order to solve things. Do realize that if you can have no fundamental bias to solve that question, you can keep trying and trying for your whole life and you will never solve it as well for humans. Like uh, if I ask you to solve a math Olympiad problem, you have no idea what methods to use. You will never solve it. Or like something more realistic. If I ask you to take food from the fridge, but I block your way to the fridge, you can't because like there's there's no option to <laughs> to solve it. Yeah. So, so right. Yeah. There's a yeah. limit to how much the search can do. Uh, but it's still fundamentally a a matching between your action capability and your task. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, this idea of uh, multiple agents with different 
sampling at their own with their own biases. I think this is what makes humans so special because um, like I would like to give this analogy of the computer. Like a computer wouldn't be able to be made if you don't have someone that can do the electronics, someone that can do the programming, someone that can do the structure of the computer. And so, there's so many different things that happen there. If it was just one person, I don't think if it was just one person, I don't think the computer would have been invented. So a lot of things that humans can do are actually collaborative, and it's because different people have different biases, share information together, and learn together. And I think that is what is needed for AI to you know self improve to to do better. They need to have a population, each with different mm-hmm. biases, and all learning from one another, or at least learning from the best. Yeah, but uh, to, yeah. To- to conclude today's uh, discussion, I think we can go on. We should continue this uh, idea of sampling another time. But to conclude today's focus, we don't go to the population level yet. We are still at the single agent level. Uh, I think in order to get a good outcome, we need to sample with the right abstraction spaces. We need to sample with the right biases in terms of like what to focus on. Like it could be deliberative search or whatever, like focus on math or focus on food, you know, it kind of stuff. And you also need some form of adjustment to the environment. Like this is the refinement step. As long as you know that something is wrong, you correct your search a little bit. You search for chocolate ice cream. In the end, no one talks about chocolate. You correct it, maybe it becomes brown ice cream. And you get, so th- this, this three things, sample with right extraction, sample with right biases, and sampling with iteration. I think these are key things. And one last thing is like moving on. You could have multiple agents sampling independently in a population and they share knowledge. So this one is, is for it's more of the high level thing. Yeah, more or less I would like to like summarize today's discussion these four steps. Yeah, uh, there you have any any comments on this? Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Uh <laughs> yeah no I think that that's pretty much uh what we're both getting at is like Getting the subtraction spaces right. I think my my idea is about like that. Um, I like kind of like learning how to learn and how to create your own abstraction spaces. Yeah. How to take both. I think that's like more ambitious. That might be later down the line, but I think starting here is good. And then once we get this down pretty step, we can start moving on to like learning how to learn, learning your own abstraction spaces, how to create your own action spaces, how to create your own perspectives in your own agents, essentially. I agree. If we can learn how to create our own abstraction and learn to create our own actions, we will essentially solve intelligence. Yeah, this is not, not solvable right now, but we are getting there. Like, yeah. I have to go in more in depth with how, because I believe action spaces and uh, like abstraction spaces are all linked to how we store knowledge um, in the brain. And based on my research, I mean, just give like, I actually came across the, this thing called the default mode network that um that condition that gives network that gives schemas to encode memory. I am getting a few neuroscience friends to like see like what this is all about because I'm not familiar with this literature. But I mean, if you can somehow crack the code of how we can get this abstraction spaces represented, it will be very powerful because then we can use that to learn new abstraction spaces and so on. So those are um a bit more orthogonal stuff, but I think all these are relevant to to your point on how to learn this. Okay, uh, before we talk more, <laughs> because it were, it's a very, very long session already, uh, yeah. let me just add this and say that I think multiple sampling and uh, filtering, it's something that is core to intelligence. Uh, there's a lot more, but if we can get this right, we will solve most of intelligence already. And yeah, I'll end here and see you all around. <laughs>